Thanks for listening to this episode of the Paranormal Nothing podcast. Before we begin the show, I want to read an email received from a listener who will remain anonymous. He describes his encounter with what is most probably known as the Michigan Dogman. It was wintertime last year in White Lake, Michigan, Highland Recreation Park. Me and my lady had an argument, so I went to cool down and take a walk. January 2020, not sure the exact date, mid-January. I was by myself. I had walked at least a mile into the state park in the middle of the night. Sat down on the snow, back up against a tree to smoke a cigarette. I had been sitting there for approximately 20 minutes. We have a lot of deer in the area. At first I thought it may be a deer. I know the difference between a two-legged animal and a four-legged animal, and have been hunting many times. This was definitely walking upright on two feet. When I realized it, it was walking on two feet. My next thought was that this was a homeless person. Then whatever it was circled me at least 50 to 70 yards out. I had a very uneasy feeling. Something was circling me, and I had a very uneasy feeling of being hunted. So I stood up and started to make my way back. That is when it stepped into a clearing, and I saw, very clearly, the body of a man and the head of a dog. I made eye contact with it for approximately 8 to 10 seconds, as crazy as it sounds. I swear that it had red glowing eyes. At this point, my heart rate doubled, and I was scared as I had no weapons on me. At this point, I turned and ran with everything I had. Whatever it was, it was not natural and scared me. Hands like humans, hair all over the body, and claws for hands. That was the fastest smile I ever ran in my life, and I am 52 years old. Probably this thing chased me or shadowed me for at least a quarter of a mile, until I lost it and got home. I didn't sleep the rest of that night. Going out after dark made me nervous, even if it was right in our driveway. For several weeks afterwards, it would make my heart race just thinking about it. Not much scares me in this world. I did not tell anyone for several weeks as it sounded crazy and did not think anyone would believe me. Afterwards, I did a lot of research and the dogman in Michigan is pretty common. The park is a good hour north of Detroit, just south of Flint, Michigan. I looked into this park and there have been other sightings in this park. This is one thing I really do not want to encounter again. On a personal note, I do not feel whatever this was is a natural creature. Let's move on now to today's episode. Stories of witches especially taking place in medieval England, with its dusty and gloomy castles and perennial grey skies, are always great to hear and read during this time of the year. Most of the time, we place in the back of our minds any historicity apparent in these encounters, since we only focus on the feelings of fright and curiosity that these stories bring to our attention during the month of October. Fantastical aspects concerning the appearance, behavior, and even eating habits of witches are found in many stories of witches that we have read growing up while in school, or that even our grandparents might have handed down to us. But what if these characteristics of the archetypal witch had a real origin going back to medieval England? We know that there was a notorious witch panic that took place in Salem, Massachusetts between 1692 and and 1693, resulting in the execution of over 200 people accused of being witches or accessories to them. However, the concept of a witch panic continued occurring in England as well during these times. A few years after the Salem witch trials of the late 1600s, we see the figure of Jane Wenham appear around 1712 again in England. A widow The periodicals of the time indicate that she heralded from the village of Walkern in the city of East Herefordshire, located just north of modern-day London. There is no information as to her age when she became a widow, nor as to her parentage or her profession. 
Jane Wenham, the unassuming widow from an unassuming small English town, would go on to be listed as the last person in history, at least in England, to be tried for the crime of witchcraft. The information we know about her comes from a series of pamphlets that were published at the time of her trial. For this episode, I will be using as a point of reference the pamphlet titled A Full and Impartial Account of the Discovery of Sorcery and Witchcraft Practiced by Jane Wenham of Walkern in Hertfordshire. It was written by Francis Bragge, who was one of the first-hand witnesses at Jane Wenham's actual trial, in addition to witnessing paranormal phenomena that ultimately would be used against Wenham. In the section of the pamphlet titled An Account of the Proceedings Against Jane Wenham for Witchcraft, we begin to hear a listing of the crimes that Wenham committed that began to raise suspicions of her alleged participation in witchcraft in the minds of her fellow townspeople. But this listing is not just a bulleted section of the document showing the crimes that apparently Jane committed while a witch, but it is actually a more elaborate and very descriptive explanation of various events within Walkern and its surroundings that ultimately led to Jane's trial for witchcraft. But what exactly would entail being accused of a witch? Although 18th century England was still being mobilized by horse and buggy, one would think that superstitions as esoteric as witchcraft might have been mitigated by then, given the Salem witch trials of the late 1600s in colonial Massachusetts. So what exactly did Jane Wenham do that ultimately led to her becoming the last person tried for witchcraft in England? During the season of the witch, it's only appropriate that the case of the last witch of England, Jane Wenham, will be today's topic on the paranormal nothing. The story begins on January 29th, 1712, in Walkern. A servant named Matthew Gilston is tending to the barn of his master, John Chapman, when an old woman in a riding hood or cloak approaches him and asks for some straw. He refuses, and the old woman then goes away muttering something to herself that he could not clearly hear. Shortly after the woman leaves, and all of a sudden, he becomes physically unable to work, and instead has a sudden physical urge to run out of the barn and towards the nearby town of Munders Hill, which is three miles from Walkern. Once he arrives to Munders Hill, he asks for some straw himself from a barn he sees. When they refuse, he feels compelled again to continue running towards what looks like some dung heaps. And he collects the straw from the dung heaps and wraps it in a shirt, which he has now taken off. Then, he runs the entire distance back to Walkern, carrying this dung-laden straw in a shirt. Although this account seems comical when at first described, it becomes somewhat paranormal since Matthew Gilston states in the document referenced for this episode that he had no control over his body during the event, and that some otherworldly force was pushing him towards collecting the straw. He believes that he was sent on this fool's errand by Jane Wenham, who had disguised herself in a riding hood and was punishing him for not giving her straw when he first met her transformed into an older woman in a cloak. Gilston suspected that it was Wenham all along, since there were rumors in the town of Walkern that Wenham was a witch. Gilston would go on to tell his master, John Chapman, about the episode. Chapman then confronts Wenham and accuses her of being a witch and a bitch, which at that time was considered the worst offensive term that an English woman could be called, worse than even being called a whore. Wenham does not take this offense lightly, as expected. On February 9th, she goes to the town judge, Sir Henry Chauncey and legally accuses John Chapman of slander, not for the offense of having called her a bitch, but for accusing her of being a witch. Two days later, on February 11th, John Chapman appears in court together with Jane Wenham. However, Judge Chauncey does not feel compelled to punish Chapman or ask him for reparations due to his accusations toward Wenham. This being since Chauncey apparently has not heard very good things throughout Walkern, regarding Jane Wenham's character and integrity. So instead of handing down any form of punishment to Chapman, Chauncey puts the verdict 
in the hands of the official minister of the town of Walkern, an individual named Reverend Gardner. Reverend Gardner, in his capacity as a town religious leader, asks that Jane and Chapman learn to get along better, and orders Chapman to give Jane Wenham one shilling in payment for her troubles. This mockery of her accusation of slander towards Chapman infuriates Wenham, and she storms out of the courthouse while telling everyone he there that hears her. If she could not have justice here, then she will have it elsewhere. And at this point is where the events of Jane Wenham's alleged acts of witchcraft truly begin. After storming out of the Walkern courthouse due to her belief in a weak verdict handed down to Chapman by the Reverend Gardner, instead of heading home, she goes in the direction of the Reverend Gardner's home. Anne Thorne is a 16-year-old servant of the Gardner family. Anne is known in the community of Walkern as being a person of good character and is a loyal servant to the Gardner family, living full-time in their home as well. During this time, Anne was also suffering from a malformed kneecap, which at that time in 18th century England was known as having your knee out of joint, and required visits often to a bone setter, who would set the knee and the kneecap properly back into place when it became too bothersome and painful. When Wenham arrives to Reverend Gardner's home, she encounters Anne Thorne sitting by the fireside in the home. Reverend Gardner and his wife, Mrs. Gardner, have also arrived at the home but are in the parlor entertaining a guest that has visited them. While in the parlor, Reverend Gardner suddenly hears hysterical screaming coming from the fireside in his home. He and his wife run towards the fireside and find Anne Thorne, semi-nude, howling, and wringing her hands in a look of agony. Anne was unable to speak, and when she was able to sit near the fireside, there was Anne's gown wrapped in a bundle. Inside the bundle was a package of broken twigs and dead leaves. When Mrs. Gardner unwraps the bundle fully, Anne cries out even louder and more fear-stricken. The gardeners did not know what was going on with Anne, and after a few moments were finally able to calm her down enough for her to relate to them what had happened to her. She said when she was left alone, she found a strange roaming in her head. Her mind, too, ran upon Jane Wenham, and she thought she must run some whither, that accordingly she ran up the close, but looked back several times at the house, thinking she should never see it more, that she climbed over a five-bar gate and ran along the highway up a hill, that there she met two of John Chapman's men, one of whom took her by the hand, saying she should go with them, but she was forced away from them, not being able to speak to either of them. Then she made her way towards Cromer, as far as a place called Hackney Lane, where she looked behind her and saw an old woman wearing a riding hood. The old woman asked her where was she going, and answered her she was going to Cromer to fetch some sticks to make a fire. The old woman told her there were no sticks at Cromer, and led her to an oak tree instead that was nearby to collect some sticks and leaves and put them in a bundle. The old woman had Anne take off her gown and apron to wrap the items in, and then handed Anne a crooked pin to pin the bundle together. The old woman then vanished before Anne's eyes. Apparently, the total distance that Anne Thorne ran during this episode was over a mile, and including the time that she spent talking to the hooded old woman, this would have calculated to Anne running at above 8 miles per hour, this being Anne Thorne with the bad and crooked knee. This first episode will be the start of what the document reports as the beginning of sorrows for the unhappy maid, Anne Thorne. The next day, February 12th, Anne is sent to pick up some items from a neighbor's house. On her way, she runs into Jane Wenham, who accuses Thorne of making up the series of lies regarding the apparent charm that Thorne was under the previous day. Wenham then tells Thorne, If you tell any more such stories about me, it shall be worse for you than it has ever been. That afternoon, Thorne goes into another fit of paranoia while at home, and is again insisting at being let go to run outside to pick up sticks. 
Her masters do not understand this absurd request, once again, especially since her fit has rendered her speechless. However, during this episode, all she does is point in the direction of Jane Wenham's house. Thorne is finally allowed to go outside, but Mrs. Gardner sends some of her staff to follow her. Anne Thorne runs in the direction of Jane Wenham's house, down a valley, but when she approaches the bottom of the valley and is at the point of climbing up, it appears that something, or someone, invisible to those with her, prevent Anne from crossing onto the other side of the valley towards Jane Wenham's house. Anne would return home, still hysterical, but once calm, would state that she had seen Jane Wenham at the bottom of that valley, and that it was Jane Wenham, invisible to all but her, that did not let her continue onwards. Continuing on, that same evening of February 12th, Anne Thorne once again suffers another bout of hysteria, and this time insists that she be left to go outside and go to Jane Wenham's house. But in this hysteria, she begins to scratch at herself and is screaming like an animal. Apparently, not even a group of men could hold her down, since it appeared that she, all of a sudden, possessed an enormous amount of strength. During this bout, all she was able to vocalize was the name of Jane Wenham. And so Jane Wenham was brought by the town authorities over to see Thorn. As soon as Jane Wenham spoke to her, Anne Thorne's color came into her cheeks, and she started up crying. You are a base woman, you have ruined me, and flew upon her to scratch her, saying, I must have your blood, or I shall never be well. She scratched Jane Wenham in the forehead with such fury and eagerness that the noise of her nails seemed to all that were present as if she were scratching against the wainscot. Yet no blood followed. Jane Wenham holding her head still and saying, Scratch harder then, and fetch blood to me if you can. Yet no blood came, although her forehead was sadly mangled and torn by the girl's nails. Thorn screamed at Wenham that her hysteria which according to Thorne she could not control, was due to Wenham's witchery. After Wenham left the house, Thorne was finally able to calm down and then slept. But her ordeals were not over yet. The next day, February 13th, Thorne once again suffered a bout of hysteria, but this time, since her masters were not with her, escaped from the house and began to run through the hills in search of apparently sticks to collect. However, there were townspeople around the hills that saw Thorn running at an incredulous speed through those hills, and could not believe the speed that she had since everyone knew that she had a bad knee. Once Thorn returned home, she was oblivious to the fact that she had collected more sticks in her gown, and again, while back at home, continued her hysterical behavior, crying, yelling, and appearing to be in pain at every movement of her body. Thorn began to complain that the sticks she was carrying were causing her her pain. And so Mrs. Gardner, who was now home, took the sticks from Thorn and flung them into the fire. Her suffering was halted momentarily, until Thorn began to complain that she had a pin stuck in her gown that was causing her more suffering. Mrs. Gardner was taken aback at this, but then was able to pull out an old, crooked pin that was somehow embedded in Thorn's gown. At that moment, Thorne was able to remember that during her running through the hills that morning, she had come upon an old woman, again wearing a riding hood, whom had given her this crooked pin to take with her. Thorne could only remember this old woman's hand as it extended the pin towards Thorne, since the hand was the color of the blackest night of Walkern. As Anne Thorne continued her apparent bouts of a delusion and hysteria, there was no hard evidence yet to bring the Walkern authorities in order to formally accuse Wenham of being a witch and purposefully cursing Thorn. During this time in England and throughout the American colonies, individuals could be vetted as being witches by having them perform some tests that would apparently be legitimate signs of having partaken in the dark arts. One of these tests was throwing an alleged witch in the water to see if she could sink or float. If she floated, this was a sign of having renounced baptism and instead taken arms in the devil's service. Another test was the ability of the accused witch to recite prayers out loud, in particular 
The Lord's Prayer. The evening of February 13th, Jane Wenham would ultimately face one of these tests. That evening, Thorne once again became hysterical and could not be held down during a violent fit of clawing at herself, screaming and yelling, and at times appearing to not breathe and become extremely pale. Wenham was again brought by the town authorities to see Thorne at the gardener house, since it appeared that Thorne was only able to regain some composure when in the presence of Wenham, albeit enough composure to only attack Wenham and scream at her at that. She wanted some of Wenham's blood. However, that night, after having witnessed the crooked pin that Miss Gardner found on Anne Thorne's gown, and seeing that Thorne was not getting any better, and no one knew how it was that a simple-minded servant could all of a sudden develop an illogical behavioral and psychological lunacy from one day to the next. Those present in the Gardner home that evening formally accused Wenham of being a witch and of causing Anne Thorne suffering. They accused her of being a witch for above twenty years, and other things said to that effect. Then Jane Wenham protested she was innocent, and offered to be tried by throwing her into the water. One of the company replied there was no occasion for it at the present, but only desired her to let him hear her say the Lord's Prayer. Wenham made several attempts to do it, but could not, always miffing two or three sentences. Mrs. Gardner had her try whether she could say it after her, and repeated it sentence by sentence, slowly to Wenham. But neither could Wenham do this, to the amazement of all the bystanders. It was observed, though Wenham tried ten times, she could not say this sentence. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, nor that lead us not into temptation. The next day, February 14th, Jane Wenham is brought by the town authorities to the town judge of Walkern, Sir Henry Chauncey. At this initial accusation, all parties, including the gardeners, Matthew Gilston, John Chapman, and even Anne Thorne are present. Everyone, including a calm Anne Thorne, are able to provide t accusatory statements against Jane Wenham. Sir Henry Chauncey sees that this accusation towards Jane Wenham for the crime of witchcraft carries merits, and so adjourns the trial until the next day at a location closer to his home. Everyone goes home for the night, including Wenham, since no evidence against her has been formally analyzed. That night, at the Gardner home, Anne Thorne once again has a bout of ag agonizing paranoia. As soon as Anne Thorne was returned home to her master's house, she had another fit as grievous as any before, and was speechless, but very sensible. Upon Mr. Gardner asking her whether he could pray for her, she held up her hands as a sign that they should, and as soon as he had repeated three or four sentences of the Lord's Prayer, she fell down on her knees and rehearsed the prayers after the minister as well as any of the company. About half an hour later she had another fit, and was recovered out of that also by prayer. Then they kept her reading until four o'clock in the morning, when she went to bed, having no more fits the rest of the night. The next day, February 15th, would mark the official start of the trial of Jane Wenham for the accusation of witchcraft. The trial this time would occur near Judge Chauncey's home in Ardley Berry. Present were all previous witnesses, in addition to the now Reverend Strum, the official minister of Ardley Berry. And once again, Jane was unable to say the Lord's Prayer when asked as a sign that she was not a witch. At trial at Ardley, Mr. Strum asked her before all the company whether she could say the Lord's Prayer. She answered she could, and attempted several times to do it, going on very readily till she came to forgive us our trespasses, which she could not repeat, nor these two sentences together, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, but would instead say, lead us not into temptation and evil, or lead us into temptation and evil, or even lead us not into no temptation, but deliver us from all evil. When she found she could not, with all her endeavors, say the Lord's Prayer, she tried to excuse herself by alleging she was much disturbed in her head by the hurry she was in, saying, 
she wanted rest and would try again to say the prayer the next day. Judge Chauncey allowed this, and so Mr. Strum and the other witnesses would wait until the next day for Wenham to finally be able to say the Lord's Prayer in front of all the witnesses. After all, Wenham herself said that all she needed was a little rest. However, the next morning, Mr. Strum headed to the courthouse and once again asked Wenham if she could recite the Lord's Prayer, now that she had a full night's sleep under her belt. Jane said that her head had settled after a good night's rest, and that she could say the Lord's Prayer, and having tried several times in the night, and that there was no doubt that she could say it. But, after attempting several times in the presence of Mr. Strum, once again that morning, she could not say the Lord's Prayer, and made the same blunders as before. At this point, Mr. Strutt asked Jane Wenham point blank if she was a witch. She said, almost embarrassingly and quietly, that she was a witch, but that there were other witches also living in Walker as well. Strutt then asked her if Wenham had played a part in the bewitching of Anne Thorne. Wenham said that she had bewitched Anne Thorne because Thorne vexed her. Wenham, with now nothing to hide, then admitted that she had been a witch for sixteen years. She said that what induced her to become a servant of the Wicked One was that she had a malicious and wicked mind from the beginning. For when any of her neighbors vexed her, or sh she used horrid curses and imprecations on which the devil took advantage of her. And there it was. Wenham had finally confessed to being a witch, ironically, being outdone by not being able to say a simple prayer correctly. Within the next few days of the trial, there were more witnesses that came forward as well, with accounts of having been attacked by the now notorious Witch of Walkern. Susan and William Aylott were a married couple living in Walkern at the time of the trial. Susan, at Jane's trial, declared that twelve years earlier, her young child had died a week after having his hair stroked by Jane Wenham, who at the time had gone to Susan's home to apologize for an argument the two women had had earlier in the week. The argument stemmed from another accusation for Wenham, where she was accused of having bewitched a town member named Richard Harvey as a result of an argument that had occurred with Harvey and Wenham's late husband at that time. Susan Eilat believed that her child had died mysteriously after Wenham had visited Eilat to apparently try to make peace for their arguments, which Susan at the time of the visit and at the time of the trial did not feel was sincere. Another accusatory witness that came forward was Thomas Adams, also of Walkern. A few months before the trial, about a month before Christmas to be exact, Adams declared that he had caught Wenham on his property's turnip fields, attempting to steal some of his produce. When he caught her, he told her she could not take the turnips, but, on the other hand, she could if she paid for them. Wenham dropped the turnips on the spot and ran away, muttering to herself. A few weeks later, Adam said that many of his prized sheep began to die mysteriously, without any sign of impending sickness or bodily harm. Adams declared at Wenham's trial that he felt these mysterious deaths were a result of Wenham's curse on his sheep due to he not letting her take the turnips without paying for them. But during the trial at Ardley Berry, what was happening with the increasingly paranoid Anne Thorne? Apparently, Thorne continued with her fits of lunacy and paranoia that could only be stopped with prayer and with having Wenham brought before Thorne, so that Thorne could then state, Are you come again to torment me? I'll have your blood and tear you to pieces. And just like Thorne had come home during one of her fits, carrying an old and crooked bewitched pen, apparently given to her by Wenham, who was disguised as an old woman wearing a riding hood. At Wenham's trial, Judge Chauncey noticed that during a conversation with Wenham, a pin seemed to appear on Wenham's fingertips. Judge Chauncey plucked the pin from Jane's fingertips. Are you going to bewitch Anne Thorne again with this pin? So he took Jane Wenham's arm and ran the pin into it six or seven times finding she never once winced for it, but held her arm still 
as if nothing had been done to it. And seeing no blood come, he ran it in a great many more times. Still no blood came, but she stood talking, and never minded it. Then again he ran it in several more times. At last he left it in her arm, that all the company might see it. Then he plucked it out before them all, and there just appeared a little thin water serum, but nothing that you could call blood. It was now February 17th, and after having finally admitted to bewitching Aunt Thorne, Jane Wenham appeared to behave more freely as herself, even while imprisoned. As Judge Chauncey deliberated her sentence, and witnesses came forward with their stories, Jane Wenham would pass the nights, singing and dancing, within her prison chambers. It seemed that her confession had eased her conscience a bit. The pin incident of the day before would continue on on the 17th. Apparently, during the trial, witnesses indicated that pins started to appear all over Jane Wenham. Pins were found in her gown pockets, in the crooks of her hands, in her hair, and even in her mouth. No one knew where all of these very sharp pins were appearing from, but witnesses knew that they were not there a few seconds before they actually appeared. The pins had materialized right before them, in front of their eyes, materialized from thin air. On March 4th, the trial of Jane Wenham for the accusation of witchcraft would finally come to an end. At about nine in the morning, the trial came on before Justice Powell, who ranked above Judge Chauncey. After the usual formalities, and the prisoner having pleaded not guilty, the jury were sworn and the witnesses called over, a total of sixteen witnesses in all. Afterwards, the prisoner saying little for herself, but that she was a clear woman, the judges summed up the evidence to the jury in a short speech, and left it to them whether it was sufficient to take away the prisoner's life upon the indictment. The jury desiring some time to consider it, the court adjourned till three in the afternoon, it being now past one, and then the jury returned and brought in their verdict, that the prisoner was guilty upon the evidence. My lord then asked them whether they found her guilty upon the indictment for conversing with the devil in the shape of a cat. The four men answered, We find her guilty of that. Upon this verdict, the prisoner received sentence of death, but was reprieved till further orders. Judge Powell, however, appeared to have a proclivity for mercy towards one him, in direct opposition. Chauncey and to the masses that found too much corroborating evidence in favor of the accusation of witchcraft. This proclivity probably stemmed from his skepticism towards the true nature of the evidence presented to the jury. And so, while Jane Wenham waited in prison for the finalization of her death sentence, Judge Powell was able to obtain an official royal pardon from the Queen for Wenham. This pardon was not to the liking of the crowds that had presented so much evidence of Wenham's witchcraft to the jury at Ardley Berry. What then occurred was an almost modern-day witch hunt, no pun intended. The likes of what we see would happen now on Twitter. It could have been called a medieval Twitter war, where county clergy together with the accusing public began to publish pamphlets outlining and describing the events of the witchcraft that Jane Wenham was accused of, while those followers of Justice Powell began to publish pamphlets to the opposite effect, citing that the evidence presented against Wenham was a result of medieval superstitions. The level of skepticism presented by this faction was ahead of its time, so to speak. This feud between opposing sides would ultimately go nowhere, and the official pardon for Wenham by the Queen of England would remain. But whatever happened to Anne Thorne, did the acquittal of Jane Wenham cause further malaise for Thorne, or did the end of the trial also bring an end to Anne's tumultuous behavioral episodes? After this, the maid continued pretty well, but on Wednesday the 12th of March, Anne Thorne saw Jane Wenham again several times in the afternoon and at night. She told her she was come to plague her, but the maid received no further hurt that night. The next day, she saw her again in the shape of a cat. I asked her how she knew that cat to be Jane Wenham. She said she knew it to be her, 
because the face of the cat was like hers, and the cat spoke to her and told her she would torment her. An hour or two after this, she saw Jane Wenham in her proper shape several times and was violently pinched as before, and that she had a knife conveyed to her hands and afterwards into her pocket. She knows not how, but that she was tempted to destroy herself with the knife. But at the end of the trial, after the apparent death sentence handed down to Jane Wenham and her subsequent pardon, Anne Thorne appears to have finally turned the corner on her breakdowns. Anne's mistress says she is a diligent and faithful servant, and one that minds good things, and loves to say her prayers and go to church. She is not yet seventeen years old, and has seen but little of the world, have never been far from home. The literature of the time goes on to state that ultimately, Jane Wenham would leave Walker and retire to Herdingfordbury, which was a village about 14 miles south of Walker. In Herdingfordbury, apparently, all witchcraft that Jane Wenham practiced while in Walker would stop, since no additional accounts of her alleged supernatural mischief would occur at Herdingfordbury. Jane Wenham, the last alleged witch to be condemned to death, by an English jury, would die of natural causes 18 years later, on June 11, 1730. The Witch of Walkern, Jane Wenham, and her minions of screeching nocturnal cats and crooked pins were no more. She had even come to embody the ancient image of a witch having the form of an old grandmother, together with the riding hood. Was Jane Wenham truly the embodiment of all that we have come to associate with the medieval witch, personifying all of these attributes, while she herself would become the last person in England tried for witchcraft? Or was Jane Wenham the unfortunate victim of a medieval mass protest, where the masses came to dictate what the law meant and how it should be enforced, regardless of the crime, or the victim, or the accuser? It is hard to tell, especially when unfortunately, medieval witch hunt hysteria epics were many throughout the 16 and 1700s. A lot of the elements of the Jane Wenham story contained these archetypal attributes of a witch hunt, an offended party, cursed objects, crooked nails, bundles of burning sticks, an innocent sounding and looking maid, an old woman dressed in a riding hood, bloodletting, and even the element of not being able to enunciate proper prayers. But were these elements that were put in place in order to fit the narrative? Or did the narrative contain these elements to begin with? There are accounts of the events from both the pro and against sides, but the fantastical elements of the story, such as Anne's incredible speed during her fool's errand, or her inordinate strength when undergoing one of her hallucinatory spells, gives the story the impression that there could have been elements of demonic possession at play in the narrative. However, even in the cases of alleged demonic possession and or infestation, the mental state of the victim, in this case Anne Thorne, has to be fully analyzed in order to rule out mental states such as schizophrenia, psychosis, and multiple personality disorder, among others. Historical data also indicates that Jane Wenham had been married multiple times, and again, that the death of her first husband might have been caused at the hands of Anne's witchery. But are these accounts real history, or are they again events created to fit the narrative? Or were the events the unfortunate results of a mob mentality against Wenham, a widow and thus seen as already an outcast in a society largely controlled by the church? In the opinion of your humble narrator, the case of Jen Wenham is probably a combination of both of these types of elements, fantastical in order to prove the point that she had dabbled in witchcraft, which I think she really might have, especially given the episodes, plural, where she was unable to pronounce the exact words of the Lord's Prayer, after multiple attempts. But also where Wenham was the victim of an attempt to push her out even further to the fringes of society. She was already on the fringes, since she was again living as a widow. By creating a witch hunt against her, the results of this would cast her out, beyond the reaches of accepted society and away from Walkern and their tightly-knit community.
In the End, The Case of the Last Witch of England, Jane Wenham, remains in the realm of the paranormal nothing. Thank you for listening. The Paranormal Nothing Podcast is a home production hosted by Juan Quiroz. You can find more info on the podcast by searching for The Paranormal Nothing on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. <laughs>